Good afternoon and uh, good morning, dear all, depending on the time zone. I would like to welcome you on a weekly discussion of the Research Center of Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya office. It takes place every Thursday at uh, 4 p.m. Vilnius time. And today we have a very uh, pressing uh, topic, Belarusian lawyers and human rights defenders at risk and what could be done. And uh, we all know uh, the, the recent increase in amount of political prisoners in country. And at the moment, according to Human Rights Center last night, it's 829, but it's only officially recognized uh, numbers. And there are uh, numerous politically motivated sentences that are being issued as well as trials. And uh, in this situation, when the principles of rule of law de facto does not function, uh, the role of human rights defenders and lawyers is extremely important. And um, today, um, and actually, apart from this, the fact that human rights defenders and lawyers, that they play such an important role, uh, they became a target of the regime repression and persecution. And today, today I would like to um, discuss this issue with our speakers. And the question that we'll, we will be discussing is what is actually happening in the lawyers. Uh, and uh, who are defending uh, politically motivated um, cases and uh, what support and assistance uh, can be provided and how we, how the national community can help it and how they could be assisted on a local level. Uh, what actions uh, are already being taken and what should be done more? And today I would like to welcome our speakers. Is, this is uh, Sergei Vikvatsky. Uh, He's expert on legal affairs and uh, the one who was defending uh, numerous motivated, politically motivated cases as well as was defending Maxim Znak and Katerina Andreeva. Thank you very much for joining us, Sergei. Uh, Thank you. Also to welcome the um, co-founder of International Committee for Investigation and Tortures, as well as chairperson of legal initiatives and member of human rights Russian Human Rights House in Vilnius uh, and, and Ilya Nuzov, who is the head of the Eastern uh, Europe and Central Asia Desk International Federation for Human Rights. And Lutina welcome. Uh, lawyer, is a lawyer who also defended numerous motiva political motivated cases in Belarus, and she's a post defender of Maria Kalesnikova, nominee and nominee for international award lawyers for lawyers and IBA. Thank you very much all for joining us today. And it's my great pleasure and honor to see you all. Um, and uh, the first floor and the first question that I would like to discuss today is uh, the situation and what is happening right now to the lawyers and lawyers. And I think here, Sergei Dikrovsky, uh, you can share a lot of insights and you have maybe your personal experience of what is actually going on, and as well as maybe you can provide any kind of recommendation to the uh, national community as a way to Belarusians how to support uh, work of uh, lawyers inside of country. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your inv invitation. Me. Uh, as for the persecution of lawyers, I can say that in the past uh, year and a half, we have uh, we have seen the ratio of the advocacy at the independent institute and lawyers who defend um, activists are subject to pressure and repression. If we talk uh, about the pressure, uh, it started in the summer of 2020 and it started with personal talks with lawyers and it ends in deprivation of uh, lawyers' licenses in the expl explosion from the, from the bar. Uh, for example, I personally had a uh, talk with the head of Minsk Bar Association in uh, summer 2020 when I uh, publicly started my, de my desire to help uh, people and to advise them on the electoral, electoral code electoral legislation and in such conversation i was pointed out that a lawyer shouldn't be uh, in politics and uh, apparently the an attorney's uh, decision an attorney an attorney's open statement uh, about the possibility to consult on uh, legislation law is already uh, politics uh, 
And, and during that conversation, I was uh, talked about, uh, I was asked to remember cases of uh, 20, uh, that, ha that happened to attorneys in 2011. And um, in 2011, several attorneys were disbarred. Uh, those attorneys who defended uh, candidates for presidency in 2010, and uh, those who defended uh, activists in, this in those presidential uh, campaign. So nobody told me that I couldn't be that I couldn't be expelled from the bar. But the message was uh, was really obvious. And from such conversation uh, conversations in the summer of 2020 um, the leadership of the uh, bar and the um, representatives of ministry of justice came to their public statements that the lawyers shouldn't be engaged in politics and uh, by politics they mean lawyers uh, publicly commenting uh, their clients cases and afterwards, uh, Ministry of Justice and uh, re and uh, Bar of uh, Bar Associ Association moved to actions, beginning from uh, autumn 2020 to nowadays. They expelled a huge number of lawyers who defend political prisoners who actively express their their opinions opinions. Uh, Till now, we had uh, at about 40 lawyers who were expelled from the bar. And this is a significant uh, number as uh, the, the number of attorneys who uh, dealt with this political number, uh, deal with these political cases is about 150. I personally was expelled from the bar in March 2021 after my uh, after the commission in the Ministry of Justice decided that I'm not qualified enough to uh, practice law. And uh, the, the reason for calling me to this commission hearing was three of my comments to uh, to media about uh, cases of my of my clients. And uh, there are new rules of professional ethics which were adopted by the Ministry of Justice recently. And uh, according to the law, these rules should be proposed by the lawyers themselves. But as I know, uh, they were even now discussed with the lawyers. And uh, the main point of these rules is uh, concerning about uh, comment, uh, commenting uh, the, uh, the cases of their clients by the lawyers. And uh, first, lawyers cannot express an opinion uh, on the guilt or innocence of defendants he is not defending. And secondly, when making comments, the lawyers are obliged to use only statements confirmed by the materials of the case. Thus, the lawyers are forbidden to talk about uh, people they are not defending. And in fact, even uh, in fact, they are not even allowed to say uh, to inform their client's position if this position is not confirmed by, by the materials of the case. Uh, so currently, we still had uh, have good lawyers who ready to professional uh, professionally defend their clients, but uh, there were probably no lawyers left who ready to actively actively express their, uh, their opinion and, and their position. And uh, recently, the way amendments to law and advocacy uh, and uh, these amendments are establishing full control of Ministry of Justice over the uh, activities of the lawyers. Here are main, uh, five main changes to, to the law. First, that candidates to the position of the council of the bar, uh, of the member of the council of the bar, should be adopted by the Ministry of Justice in advance. Previously, no such adoption, uh, no such approval was uh, was required. Second, before to, uh, before uh, taking the bar examination, there should be trainership in the bar, and uh, the Ministry of Justice approves the, mm, the list of trainees. Uh, previously, uh, the list of trainees was determined by the Council of the Bar uh, itself. Uh, the third, 
is to become a lawyer, uh, former employees of courts, police and investigative agencies do not have to pass an exam, but uh, pass only um, oral interview with the commission. Previously, all the, uh, all the uh, lawyers should, uh, all the candidates without any exemptions uh, had to pass an exam. Fourth, uh, the only uh, way of lawyers works is consultations. Consultations is the uh, type of organization which is created by the bar and uh, uh, the head of this consultation is appointed by the ministry by the ministry of justice previously there were another forms of uh, activity for lawyers for example uh, advocates bureau which were operated and created by lawyers themselves and uh, lawyers are, are also were entitled to work uh, individually and the fifth change is that the, the budget of the bar association uh, is uh, approved by the councils of the bar uh, which uh, members are supposed to be improved by the Ministry of Justice. And previously, uh, this budget were approved by the meeting of the Bar Association. So we can see that uh, the repression to lawyers is really huge, and these changes is really deprives of uh, lawyers, lawyers' independence. Uh, I will stop uh, just now. Another other other people could talk and probably will answer your question in, in a little bit later. Uh, thank you very much, Sergey, for um, your insights and what you shared. And I would like to remind our audience that you can uh, drop your question in the chat box and then we will follow up on them in uh, during the Q&A session after each speaker will have a floor. And right now, Ludmila, please, if you could share more on this topic about the situation of uh, lawyers in Belarus and maybe share your personal experience as well as what in particular you think is uh, necessary to support uh, the work and activity of lawyers in Belarus. Сейчас слышно? Спасибо большое за приглашение на данную дискуссию. И э, я вкратце обрисую ситуацию, которая сейчас э, существует в адвокатском сообществе Беларуси. Ситуация, конечно, далеко не утешительная, и э, предполагается, что дальше тоже ничего хорошего происходить не будет. Э, по состоянию на вчерашний день э, из адвокатуры э, исключены, лишены права на профессию, по нашим, э, может быть, даже не совсем достоверным данным, минимум 36 адвокатов. Э, возможно, о ком-то мы еще даже и не знаем, потому что некоторые действительно не хотят эту афишировать информацию, но из тех э, э, адвокатов, о которых мы точно знаем, а это 36 человек, э, соответственно, можно сделать вывод о том, что все они исключены исключ... исключительно в связи с с некими политическими мотивами. Из наиболее ярких таких эпизодов в нашем нехорошем вот этом вот течении ситуации с адвокатами можно, конечно, вспомнить ситуацию с Натальей Мацкевич и Евгением Пыльченко, которые буквально внезапно были... Их деятельность была прервана внезапно, приостановлена, и в течение короткого времени они были исключены из коллегии адвокатов по абсолютно каким-то незначительным нарушениям, которые преподносились как нарушения, которые составляют существенные какие-то основания правила профессиональной этики адвокатов. В последнее время очень печальной становится тенденция, которая заключается в том, что Министерство юстиции издает приказ о возбуждении дисциплинарного производства и сразу же приостанавливает деятельность адвокатов, как это было э, в ситуации с Натальей Мацкевичем, с Евгением Пыльченко. И, э, собственно говоря, после таких мер э, адвокат лишен возможности вообще э, осуществлять свою профессиональную деятельность, делать что-либо. И э, то, что это начало применяться в отношении адвокатов, которые участвуют в важных процессах, в резонансных делах, это, конечно, очень настораживает. 
И эта тенденция вот в отношении всех последних случаев, произошедших с адвокатами, она имела место. Меры, которые предпринимаются в отношении адвокатов, совершенно разные. Если еще, скажем, там, год с лишним назад, когда начинались только репрессии, Наши правоохранительные органы были более изобретательны, и Министерство юстиции тоже пыталось какую-то э, относительно маску законности иметь, то теперь уже абсолютно не э, утруждаются тем, чтобы как-то более или менее соблюдать закон и просто без э, каких-либо оснований адвокаты лишают права на профессию. Э, очень хотелось бы обратить внимание на очень такой важный аспект, который заключается в том, что именно э, в последнее время руками самих адвокатов э, э, адвокаты исключаются из... Э, э, профессионального сообщества и лишаются права на профессию. Министерство юстиции очень активно использует в настоящее время само адвокатское сообщество, именно дисциплинарные комиссии, в которые отправляются возбужденные Министерством юстиции дисциплинарные производства. И наши же коллеги, абсолютно не сомневаясь, исполняют приказ Министерства юстиции, и несмотря на то, что оснований для того, чтобы адвоката признать виновным в совершении каких-то дисциплинарных действительно нарушений не имеется, вносят решение о том, чтобы, что они, что, чтобы их исключить из коллегии. И вот эта тенденция, она настораживает, конечно, в последнее время больше всего, поскольку сам институт, институт адвокатуры, по сути, себя дискредитирует такими действиями. Из последних таких наиболее ярких событий прошла, например, конференция Минской городской коллегии адвокатов, где наше руководство абсолютно во всеуслышание заявило о том, что те адвокаты, которые были исключены, собственно говоря, сами в этом виноваты, поскольку э, осуществляли защиту по политически мотивированным делам. Э, что еще хотелось обратить внимание? Конечно, вот эта вот ситуация с э, таким, такими массовыми репрессиями в отношении адвокатов, э, безусловно, прежде всего влияет на э, то, каким образом могут реализовать свое право на защиту э, их клиенты. Конечно, все мы в курсе ситуации, в которой оказался, например, тот же Виктор Бабарик, у которого, который лишился всех своих защитников, того же Сергея Тихановского, у которого Наталью Мацкевич прямо из процесса фактически выбили и многие другие. Николай Дедок, конечно, это отражается на клиентах, это отражается на тех адвокатах, которые в дальнейшем вступают в в такие дела. И, безусловно, здесь речь идет о том, что государством в лице Министерства юстиции прежде всего нарушается принцип неотождествления адвоката и его клиента. Хочется еще обратить внимание на то, что сам наш руководящий орган Белорусской республиканской коллегии адвокатов в последнее время крайне стало э, негативно высказываться о тех адвокатах, которые э, исключены из коллегии, и э, даже навесило на них ярлык «невероятные адвокаты», э, вот, что тоже, э, собственно, говорит о том, что само руководство ассоциирует э, тех адвокатов, которые исключены, с ими клиентами, что, конечно же, в принципе недопустимо. Вот. Конечно, какие меры можно было бы принять э, в моем понимании? Прежде всего, это, безусловно, самое важное – это международная поддержка и то, что ситуация с адвокатами, она держится на контроле, и ни один из тех случаев, которые происходят, не остается без внимания, это, безусловно, важно. Кроме того, хотелось бы, наверное, внести предложение по поводу того, что поскольку наше, в принципе, сообщество адвокатское не выполняет те функции, которые на нее возложены, а напротив способствует Министерству юстиции в том, чтобы адвокаты лишались профессии. Я полагаю, что, конечно, можно было бы рассматривать вопрос о том, чтобы 
исключить, возможно, коллегию белорусскую, республиканскую коллегию адвокатов из каких-то международных адвокатских объединений, если она там состоит, ну и по-прежнему привлекать внимание к адвокатской проблеме в Беларуси. Спасибо. Uh, Uh, and uh, I know that actually, Ilya, uh, you've been uh, publishing a report on the situation of lawyer in Belarus, right? And you can even um, give like a retro perspective of how uh, the situation, uh, work of lawyers in Belarus looked like also years ago. When and also maybe I think like you could provide also great advice on how international community can respond and support work of lawyers and human rights defenders in the country. So the floor is yours. Yes. Hi. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Um, yes, I, I wanted to, as a starting point, to speak about how the situation of lawyers has evolved over the years, because it would be a mistake to think that this is just a recent development, the precarious situation of lawyers in Belarus, and uh, my colleagues have already attested to that. Um, in 2018, FIDH jointly with the Uh, World Organization Against Torture, OMCT, and the Paris Bar Association and Human Rights Center Visna published a report, uh, Belarus Controls on Lawyers Endangering Human Rights, where it described the situation of lawyers since 2011 when the law on the bar and advocacy activities in Belarus was adopted in, in the aftermath of another election fraud, this time in 2010. And Uh, we should know that there's a tendency here. So every time that there is a public, uh, a wave of public protests in response to fraud or an unpopular, unpopular uh, measure, legislative or executive, there is a tightening of uh, the space for lawyers and independence for lawyers' profession and a crackdown against lawyers uh, as well as protesters and, and others that these lawyers defend. Um, and as... Uh, Sergey and Ludmila had already said that the law of 2011 had increased supervision of the internal management of bars, of bars uh, the selection of presidents of the bar by the Ministry of Justice. Um, the use of qualification commission was enhanced to uh, remove those that deal with sensitive political subjects by the institution of these extraordinary Uh, qualification commission examinations, which basically could be instituted at any time at the request and discretion of the Ministry of Justice. Um, the, in parallel to that, the Ministry of Justice uh, had gained the right to institute disciplinary procedures also at their discretion and then uh, revoke or suspend the license of, of, licenses of lawyers for uh, arbitrary, on arbitrary grounds. And so all that has had the effect of undermining the independence of lawyers, increasing self-censorship, uh, their ability to work effectively under the constant threat of disbarment, and uh, effectively an elimination of the institute of the bar, which is supposed to be an institute that serves to protect the lawyer's independence and their rights. Um, and we saw a similar thing happen in 2017, so further amendments were adopted that gave more control for the Ministry of Justice, and the uh, most recent amendments that Sergei uh, described in detail that, among others, the eliminated the two forms of legal practice that were previously available, namely individual practice and practice in law firms, and now leaving legal consultations, which are also effectively Um, under control of the um, Ministry of Justice. Um, so I'll pick up and maybe on the recommendations that uh, Ludmila had left off on, um, what can be done, and especially as a representative of international NGOs, what could be done in such a case? Um, first of all, I completely agree that the option of exclusion of the Republican bar um, from the international community of bar associations should always be on the table as a response to their overreach and the targeting of independence of lawyers. Um, what should also be considered 
our petitions to the Venice Commission, for instance, to weigh in on any uh, harmful innovation, uh, legislative innovation that is being considered by the authorities. Uh, this is a reputable organ and um, at times, at least in the past, maybe uh, I suppose the situation is quite different now, but in the past, the decisions of the Venice commissions have at times been heated at least to a certain extent by the authorities or the arguments of the Venice Commission have been used in legal proceedings by lawyers. Um, it's important to turn to local uh, foreign bar associations. By local, I mean, uh, for instance, the Paris Bar Association um, or other bar associations which could write letters of support of uh, lawyers who are targeted in Belarus, uh, letters denouncing the persecution of lawyers, um, or denouncing the harmful legal innovations that are being considered or uh, have already been adopted and demanding that the Republican Bar of Belarus express a clear position on how it observes the requirement that the legal profession remain independent in Belarus. And finally, and I know this is difficult under the circumstances, but the possibility to conduct missions with the representatives of foreign bars to Belarus to personally advocate for the end of repressions or legislative change or to at least share experience uh, that would encourage a different outlook. Um, and we had done that in the past when we were writing the report in 2018, uh, the visit, uh, the two missions to Belarus were conducted jointly with our uh, Paris Bar Association. And we had met with the representatives of the Republican Bar and perhaps as a consequence of, of uh, those exchanges and meetings, um, uh, at least one disbarment proceeding was halted as far as I can remember. Um, now I wanted to uh, maybe talk uh, a minute or two about the situation of human rights defenders. Of course, lawyers are human rights defenders, those that deal with uh, politically sensitive cases. And uh, obviously, uh, the situation of lawyers is very grave, but in addition to lawyers, there are other professionals that we consider as human rights defenders, namely journalists. So um, seven members of Vesna for human rights defenders are currently in jail, but in addition to those uh, 29 journalists, as far as we are concerned uh, right now, are also uh, still in jail under arbitrary charges. Uh, it should also be noted that as far as the situation of human rights defenders is concerned, that um, a lot of organizations are being liquidated. Um, as far as we know, over 200 organizations have been liquidated. And as of today, there are no more human rights, non-governmental organizations registered in Belarus. Um, so my recommendations as far as the situation of human rights defenders would uh, remain similar uh, of course it's very important to continue raising awareness and keeping uh, on the international agenda the question of the uh, persecution of lawyers and human rights defenders so it's important to continue making statements and to engage in uh, bilateral multilateral meetings with eu un osc council of europe institutions um, and sanctions should, should always be on the table to compel the regime to change its behavior and release the political prisoners. I think I'll stop here. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ilya. Uh, thank you for the recommendation. We will definitely record all of them and we'll publish summary so that everybody would, be, would have some kind of guidelines of how we can actually support uh, lawyers and lawyers and human rights defender the international level but i also would like to address victoria and uh, if you could share um, about your experience about the work of uh committee for investigation of tortures it played a very important role after the august events and i know that it also faced repressions and persecution from the state and uh the floor is yours and i also actually would like to ask if you could share at something in terms of recommendation for international community and also elaborate a bit more uh, maybe how to assist, uh, how to support lawyers on the local level. If Belarusians could do something, for example, if you can uh, 
say about your experience of work while you was you were in Belarus? Uh, thank you. Thank you for invitation. First of all, it must be said that uh, the Belarusian regime has always considered human rights defenders as enemies. Uh, but uh, what we see now, it's the beginning of uh, the war against civil society and against uh, human rights defenders. Uh, repressions uh, against human rights movement uh, began uh, immediately after uh, the outbreak of the August 2020 protests. On September 17, 2020, uh, the security forces detained Marfa Rabkova, who has the volunteer team of uh, Vesna Human Rights Center. Now seven members of Vesna uh, in jail. Uh, Alex Belyatsky, Valentin Stefanovich, Vladislav Lapkovich, Marfa Rabkova, Leonid Sudalenko, Tatiana Lasica, and Andrei Chapuk. On November 3rd, the uh, court found Leonid Sudalenko and Tatiana Lasica guilty of organizing or preparing actions that grossly violate public order and training and preparation of person for participating in such actions, as well as uh, the financing of other uh, material support. Uh, Sudalenko was sentenced uh, to three years of imprisonment and Tatiana Lasica to two and a half year of imprisonment. And during uh, 2021, hundreds of searches uh, have been conducted in the offices of human rights organizations, as well as uh, uh, apartments of uh, human rights defenders. Uh, after these uh, raids of repressions, human rights defenders, uh, many of them uh, were forced to leave country in order to continue work uh, uh, and uh, activities in safety and not be arrested. And International Committee for Investigation of Torture uh, in Belarus have faced uh, this unprecedented pressure since March 2021. Uh, first of all, our volunteer was uh, detained, and after 25 days of arrest, he became a suspect in a criminal case against the International Committee. And during the arrest and search, he was tortured in order to gain access to his computer and phone. And on April, security forces started to conduct searches in the apartment of uh, different uh, human rights defenders uh, in connection with this case uh, uh, against the International Committee. Only for our work on documentation of torture cases. And uh, as Ilya uh, already said, uh, since uh, July, uh, almost 300 NGOs were, were liquidated, and among the liquidated organizations are Belarusian Helsinki Committee, Belarusian Association of Journalists, and my organization, Legal Initiative. Uh, these are organizations uh, that have been working in Belarus for the protection and promotion of uh, human rights for 25 years, and even cooperating with uh, the government uh, some years ago. So this is a, a situation of uh, like uh, clear space without no uh, NGOs at all, only some kind of uh, governmental uh, NGOs, gongos, but no independent and of course uh, no human rights organizations. And the repressions affected not only human rights organizations, but almost all civil society organizations. A, a few days ago, Olga uh, Garbunova, the head of NGO Radislava, was detained. And uh, this organization provides assistance to victims uh, of uh, domestic violence. Now she is charged in criminal case for organizing women's protests. And this major crackdown on civil society in Belarus is yet another attempt uh, of the Lukashenko regime to silence dissent, restrict fundamental human rights, and uh, stop legitimate documentation of the regime human rights violations. Uh, the regime is so afraid of the publicity uh, of its crime that it's already blocking the websites of uh, NGOs, for example, uh, Belarusian Association of Journalists, Penn Center. And on November 5th, informational resources of the Grodna branch of uh, Human Rights Center Vesna were recognized by the court as uh, extremist material. So their website, their Facebook page, and Twitter. And uh, of course, despite all these repressions, human rights organizations continue their work, which is uh, now more important than ever. And more people need legal help, more human rights violations that need to be documented, more work needs to be done internationally to urge the regime to respect human rights. Uh, 
So without uh, the work of human rights defenders, as well as without independent journalists, Belarus will, will turn into a black hole. Human rights violations not only continued, but, but they intensified. And in the absence of any legal mechanisms within the country, and in general, in the absence of the rule of law in Belarus, reporting on human rights violations and crimes of the regime remains the only means. So at the international level, it's necessary to continue to support human rights organizations uh, that are now forced to work in exile, as well as independent journalists and lawyers expelled from the Bar Association. It's, a, it's important uh, for the state states, uh, primarily uh, neighboring states, where human rights defenders are now located to ensure their physical safety, guarantees of non-extradition to Belarus, and the possibility to legally work and stay. And of course, it's very important to continue uh, to insist on the immediate and unconditional release of all human rights defenders, as well as all political prisoners in Belarus. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Victoria, and thank you very much for all the speakers for your for your insights. Uh, if you would like to comment on one another or have questions to each other, you're welcome. Uh, let me know. And uh, now I actually would like to ask you if you have any advice for the democratic process of how they can support uh, the work of human rights defenders and lawyers. If somebody would like to have a floor here. Um, let me let me say a few words. Just uh, summarize uh, what uh, has has been already said. It's very important to uh, keep this uh, question uh, at the agenda, at the agen agenda, and in the uh, that international uh, international organizations should put attention our. Belarusian authorities to this issue. It's very important to uh, have these letters, petitions to uh, Ministry of Justice, to uh, Belarusian uh, Republican Bar Association to stop this uh, violation and prosecution of, uh, of lawyers. And it's very important also to help uh, those lawyers who were expelled from the bar, for example, and who uh, have have no opportunity to find job uh, for example today and uh, probably to help them with their some uh, experience with their with the job opportunities abroad with the, with some uh, seminars and so on it's also very very good idea to make this uh, movements through uh, travels of this of these lawyers to to encourage encourage their job Thank you very much, Sergey. Thank you. And another question that I actually have is uh, that how the opinion situation uh, of the, hum the situation with the human rights organization in Belarus influence situation of uh, socially vulnerable groups. Right now, we all probably see in the media the situation of the terrible situation on the border and this migrant crisis. And how do you feel it could it potentially affecting right now situation of migrants and vulnerable groups because, uh, you know, human rights organizations were the ones who were actually supporting uh, them. So if like Victoria, maybe you would like to answer? Uh, yes, uh, I can try to answer. First of all, um, this is, uh, first of all, this is question of people, not uh, of politics. I mean, we can uh, talk a lot of uh, who who is, uh, uh, violate law who is uh, starting all this issue all this crisis but first of all we should think about people and now we don't have any uh, registered organization in belarus ngos who can help uh, without uh, you know without uh, being detained for some reasons so it's very difficult now to provide uh, legal help humanitarian aid to those who are in this uh, very difficult situation in forest uh, near border so uh, this is uh, like um, 
of course, when uh, regime started to liquidate uh, organization, they uh, first of all they thought about uh, those who connected some kind of uh, politics for with the positions and so on. But now we see that uh, victims of domestic violence they suffer from these decisions. We see that uh, migrants suffer from these this, this decisions. So it's a very uh, bad situation for for all. But because NGOs was uh, uh, the only only, the only real force to uh, resolve uh, such problems, which uh, the government uh, decided not to even uh, mention. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you very much for clarifying the situation. And I, I think like it's definitely uh, horrible what is going on and the lack of support of uh, who is stuck right now in the border as well as other vulnerable groups are really frustrating and depressive so but still i think like there are a lot of people are still struggling uh both inside uh, still fighting for you know like for them like both inside of the country and outside and actually if you'd mila for example you or sergey or victoria if you could share your insights of how to work and still keep uh your work and activity while being while while being uh, expelled while working from abroad so Ludmila, maybe you would like to elaborate on this topic. Could you give advice for us, for example, lawyers who are also faced, you know, political repression and had to leave the country? Ну, на самом деле, я извиняюсь, я в маске, потому что в общественном месте. На самом деле, я, находясь сейчас не в Беларуси, продолжаю сотрудничать с уже ликвидированными правозащитными организациями и занимаюсь консультированием граждан по вопросам миграции там, и, и другим. Сейчас создана платформа Legal Hub, в которой мы активно участвуем и помогаем гражданам по их запросам решить их вопросы. Вот, поэтому, ну, на самом деле, то, что касается меня, то деятельность у меня довольно-таки активная. Вот, но другие адвокаты, которые, возможно, еще не нашли себе применение, конечно же, нуждаются в поддержке и, и возможном участии в каких-то проектах, поскольку, конечно, сейчас те адвокаты, которые лишены лицензии, они все обладали огромным профессиональным опытом, ценными знаниями и безусловно конечно нужно их найти им применение вот поэтому то о чем говорил сергей вот важно конечно какие-то искать э, возможности привлечения всех адвокатов потерявших работу э, к активной деятельности это было бы очень важно um, I just want to, to add some uh, some sentences that um, if uh, if we are talking, for example, uh, about uh, uh, human rights organization who uh, had the opportunity to uh, work, for example, from from abroad because they they had uh, these uh, issues which are not uh, really connected with the consultations of uh, of people on, on the ground for example uh, and they they could move move abroad but it's very difficult for lawyers who uh, have worked uh, in in belarus to uh, live abroad and to find find their job uh, ab abroad because they knew uh, Belarusian legislation and they had their Belarusian clients and so th there are no really uh, many many opportunities to them to start working in uh, to start working abroad. They they may work with international organizations, they may work with NGOs, but there are no still uh, not not so many not so many opportunities for them to work. Thank you very much, Sergei. Uh, for, like as a continuation of this question, if, uh, yeah, maybe you can say if uh, FIGL somehow supports uh, repressed lawyers and human rights defenders, or what support you provide for uh, for them as an organization. 
Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to first comment on, on your previous question regarding the situation of uh, especially vulnerable groups. And uh, just as a general matter, I think that any crisis situation exacerbates the plight of those that are especially vulnerable, such as the elderly, the disabled, the persons with disabilities, uh, women. Uh, we know that the uh, conditions of detention right now in prisons are quite bad, uh, inhumane. Uh, we know that Marfa Rabkova, for one, has suffered uh, physical um, ailments uh, during her confinement and continues to do so. Uh, and the crisis, uh, the migrant crisis is, is also, uh, the migrants are also one of those categories of people. Um, but I'd like to also caution that um, the migrant crisis which have been orchestrated by the regime should not be uh, allowed to draw uh, uh, attention away from what is happening inside of the country, because that is also one of the intentions of the regime is to create such crises to draw a, attention away from what's actually happening inside the country that's causing uh, these uh, terrible manifestations of the internal repressions that are taking place. So for us as an international NGO, one of the key things that we will be doing is again, insisting on the fact that uh, these uh, symptoms um, are indicative of what's happening of the repressions inside the country and so the release um, of political prisoners remains for us a top priority as uh, one of the presenters had said at this time there are over 830 political prisoners in belarus so one of the things that we're doing is we're uh, we created a, a, a website a resource a comprehensive resource tracking the repressions and updating in english every day the number of political prisoners, uh, providing information on the plight of uh, especially vulnerable groups on the international re reactions that are made in response to the crisis. Um, of course, uh, we do a lot of advocacy activities. So we turn to the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, to first urge for an urgent debate on Belarus, and then we've uh, mobilized other international NGOs for the establishment of the examination on the situation in Belarus. We conduct meetings with the EU institutions and other international organizations to keep the situation in Belarus on the agenda and to urge them to make resolutions condemning repressions against human rights defenders, lawyers, uh, and other um, targeted groups. And we do work um, on accountability. So FIDH is a member of the International Accountability Platform for Belarus, uh, which is a platform created by an NGO, but sponsored by states uh, to bring uh, the perpetrators of what we believe amount to crimes against humanity to account uh, in national courts using the principle of universal jurisdiction. There have been uh, complaints or investigations started in several countries, including Germany um, and Lithuania, uh, on potential uh, crimes against humanity committed by this regime. So it's important to continue uh, lobbying countries to use their instruments available to them to institute these prosecutions on a domestic level. Um, and to continue urging for adoption of resolutions uh, and sanctions to change the course of events in the uh, in the current crisis. Uh, thank you very much, Elia. But actually, like I have a follow up question: If you could share any challenges you faced as a international organization while supporting work of uh, human rights defenders and lawyers in Belarus. Sure. So, sorry, you asked also before, what, what else do we do? We also uh, are part of the Observatory for the Protection of Human Rights Defenders, together with the OMCT. And so we provide support uh, for those human rights defenders that are at risk and they are seeking to relocate, for instance, or that have already relocated and need some uh, financial support or support to uh, enhance their security, for instance. Um, 
so please do keep that in mind. And if somebody in the audience is also, um, you know, interested in that mechanism, they can they can look at FIDH's website um, and other organizations that are part of this Protect Defender uh, network. Um, but well, the biggest challenge, as always in our profession, is the the lack of response from the domestic authorities. So, you know, we do, we try to uh, issue urgent appeals resolutions and, you know, unfortunately they fall on, on deaf ears right now. So that's the biggest challenge is of course, the, the lack of, um, the lack of any, any response. Um, and the, right now it's, it's, it's the inability to, to travel to, to the region. I think the restrictions of travel are hampering all of the efforts. Well, first of all, to document uh, the violations, although I must uh, echo the sentiments of my colleagues who said that uh, the human rights organizations continue working, uh, even though they're outside of the country, uh, very courageously. Um, and, um, but of course not having access to where violations take place is, is is a big challenge and right now of course we're looking at the migrants crisis but the question of how to approach and document the violations is uh, one that might be preventing us from effectively carrying out our work uh, thank you very much Leah. Uh, and now we have actually a question from the audience. Harry, if you would like to ask it uh, yourself, so I've been giving you the floor. And I don't know. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Harry Hummel. I work with the Netherlands Helsinki Committee. Uh, and I have a couple of uh, ideas. Well, some of these are, you know, maybe more questions. Uh, one, um, uh, thing that I think might be worth uh, investigating would be to uh, look at the persons who are involved in the disbarment uh, procedure. Um, you know, I understand this is some kind of committee with people from the Ministry of Justice, but maybe also from prosecution service or from other bodies. Uh, and I think there is a good argument to be made to put these people on the sanctions lists of uh, European Union and of other uh, uh, states. Um, you know, as a means of pressure and of uh, disapproval of this, um, you know, the, the disbarment uh, uh, campaign that is happening. Uh, second idea, uh, and this follows on from some work that we uh, from the Netherlands have done uh, a number of years ago, uh, would be to look at the, you know, at other international legal um, ties that the Belarusian uh, judicial establishment has with uh, international bodies. And our particular focus in the past has been on the International Association of Prosecutors, um, who have uh, membership very widely, uh, you know, in many countries where you have dictatorial regimes, they uh, have the, you know, still prosecutors and the official prosecution service is member of this body. So our uh, aim has been to uh, point towards the uh, codes of ethics and professional codes that this uh, international association has adopted and to point to the violation that you know, these prosecutors in a big number of countries uh, commit against their own professional standards. So we want the international body in this particular case to, um, you know, enter into discussion and maybe some form of, uh, you know, procedure for suspension of Belarusian prosecution service from the international body. We have written to them already about this, I think, in December last year. We received a couple of... Uh, acknowledgements that you know they are looking into it but there seems to be very little progress so i think maybe there you know we should organize a, a more pressure on this international association of prosecutors um, third idea um, there is uh, you, most of you have probably heard about the OCE that you know that started uh, the so called moscow mechanism a procedure last year, again in October, um, which is a procedure whereby a number of uh, states that take part in the OCE can 
ask for uh, specific reporting about a particular human rights crisis, in this case, the crisis in Belarus. So a report was produced uh, already in November last year. And now just a couple of weeks ago, a follow up procedure has been started by a large number of states whereby the Belarusian uh, authorities have to respond to you know, a detailed set of questions about progress in their, well, or lack of progress in their dealing with uh, human rights issues. This could be, uh, you know, we don't know whether Belarusian authorities will reply, although, you know, according to OSCE commitments, they should do it. But this is, well, international organizations don't always function the way they should. Uh, but this, uh, you know, this remains to be seen. They, the report, they, their answer to all these questions should come pretty soon. And if this works well, then maybe there could be follow up questions also specifically asking uh, about, uh, you know, the disbarment uh, procedures and, and whether, you know, and whether there are procedures to uh, appeal against the disbarment and how these are going and all these kind of things. Um, fourth idea, uh, and this is you know, maybe the wildest idea, not, not very uh, concrete at the moment, uh, would be to look at um, international commercial ties of uh, Belarus. There is still, you know, a whole series of Western in or international companies active in Belarus. Um, they have commercial agreements with Belarusian firms, I guess, and, and uh, you know, distribution channels and all these kind of things. So there are contracts. And now we are in a situation where, uh, you know, the most critical section of uh, the lawyers community is uh, put out of action. So this means that for them, it is becoming more difficult to find good lawyers to challenge actions of the state, for example. So I think it might be uh, worth to try to, you know, formulate an argument whereby international uh, companies could complain against the purification or, you know, whatever you want to call it, the, the, um, uh, the, the limitation of their possibility to find good Belarusian lawyers. This is a bit tentative argument and I, you know the question is whether uh, companies would want to you know enter into this type of uh, action um, but I think it should be tried you know as long as is you know the idea that the Belar of the Belarusian authorities that in the end you know economic ties will not really be hurt and uh, business as usual continues with uh, international companies this idea should be shaken as much as possible so this is one entry point i think that should be tried uh, thank you very much harry uh, for all your insights if anybody from the speakers if you would like to comment and uh, maybe share something that you would like also to to include uh, Ilya, Sergey. Uh, just uh, just a few words. Uh, I I fully agree that all the people who are um, responsible for uh, who, who are guilty for the ex exclusion of uh, lawyers from the bar should be uh, held accountable. And I really I really hope that, that in in recent future we would have possibility to hold them accountable in Belarus under our Belarusian legislation, but still if uh, there, were, there is a possibility to hold them accountable abroad on the international levels, uh, level, it also would be, would be great. We, we know uh, the names of this, uh, of this person. We, uh, we have this uh, evidence of uh, what uh, have been have been done so if it's possible to bring this information and to probably to put uh, this person to sanction list yes i agree it's it's a good idea and also uh, the second option uh, the second option is about this prosecutor association i think it's also a great idea that uh, every international organization which uh, have uh, as a member of uh, one of Belarusian uh, IIS organization or state body or someone else could uh, 
give, could could have this opportunity to press uh, our Belarusian authorities to make these concerns about the situation in Belarus. And I I really hope that it would uh, help uh, just a little, but but still it 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 it, it could be done. Uh, thank you, Sergey. Uh, I actually have uh, another question about sanctions from the audience. So, um, yeah, so Vera Herdner is actually, she's saying that the current crisis on the border, uh, which is organized by Lukashenko, that is actually organized with support of Vladimir Putin's regime. And what do you think the sanctions should be imposed on both parties? And what is your attitude towards this? I can uh, I can um, address sure. some of the comments by by Harry Hummel and then maybe try to answer this question. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, no, sure. So um, just on the sanctions, I'm not so sure that the names of some of the let's say heads of the local or Republican bars are not already on the sanctions list. So charges, for, for instance, might be already on the list. And I'm not sure of the mechanisms of how the names are being channeled to the European Union, but uh, I, I think it appears to be uh, quite effective. Um, so the names that are supposed to be on the list do normally get there. Uh, but of course, I completely agree with this idea to include as many of the individuals responsible for these persecution of lawyers as possible. Um, the, the problem with that being that uh, most or all of them will never go out of Belarus. And so the sanctions in that case, at least as far as their capacity to limit restrict travel of individuals to the European Union space, uh, will not be that effective. Uh, with respect to pressure on businesses, of course, the, the sanctions packages do already target some of the state-owned enterprises, and uh, my organization is also looking into putting more pressure on transnational corporations that do continue to conduct business in Belarus. Um, of course, it's um, complicated to, difficult to make an immediate recommendation of for these types of corporations to seize their activities right away because there are also interests of workers at stake here. So I think uh, it will be good to develop some guidance at least for transnational corporations, corporations on how to behave in the current circumstances. Um, but there are some that have uh, adopted quite a good approach. For example, Yara, a Norwegian corporation has been quite good about making strong statements, uh, denouncing repressions and kind of fighting for the rights of workers of uh, Belarusian organizations that engage uh, with Yara. Um, so as far as the sanctions, so we know that the, soon the European Union will adopt the fifth package of sanctions, which will also target um, some of the loopholes that had been previously uh, allowed to remain as far as the uh, activities of the potash industry and others. Uh, some, some banks, I think Russian-based banks will be also included. And the, uh, I think what's being considered is the inclusion of the, uh, some of the airlines that channel the migrants uh, from places like Syria and Iraq to Belarus. Uh, so they're being considered for the inclusion on the sanctions list. And I don't want to speculate on the involvement of Russia at this point. There's uh, so far, uh, there are rumors, but I, I haven't seen any substantiated evidence that shows that Russia is orchestrating this uh, flow of migrants. So I don't want to make any judgments to that effect. Uh, thank you very much, Leah. Uh, so, uh, if anybody, if there are no follow-ups 
on what uh, Harry said, so I would like to... Uh, uh, can I, can I uh, address uh, the later latest uh, comment of Harry about uh, Vienna me mechanism? Uh, we as human rights community prepared uh, our assessment of uh, uh, the situation also as well as um, implementation of recommendation of Moscow mechanism and also answers uh, to these questions. And of course, we uh, address Address issues of disbarment of lawyers, as well as all issue uh, connected with uh, work of lawyers in political motivated cases. So uh, we are going to uh, send this uh, document to the states so they can receive uh, like very good information from Belarusian human rights defenders. Thank you very much, Victoria. Uh, thank you. So uh, we are slowly running out of time, but I think we still have time for another question. And actually, I think we will go for a tricky one from Eva Wiedemann. So she's asking whether there is any possibility or hope that actually International Court of Justice could start a case against Lukashenko and, and, and his team. So if you could, any of you could uh, say some words about that, like whether it's actually what are the situation at the moment and uh, how do you estimate the actual possibility? Sergey, you would like to answer? Yes, I, I tried to, to answer this question. Uh, uh, it's, it's a tricky question because Belarus is not a member of uh, Rome Statute, so uh, there are no really good mechanisms to start this uh, criminal investigation in this uh, international criminal uh, court. So I, I don't think that it's uh, it's an issue that is, is in the agenda, uh, agenda now. I know that there are some initiatives to start the case, but I'm not, um, I, I don't think that there will, would be, would be, uh, would be would be the case so my, my i think that uh, there are still some mechanisms which could be used uh, and these mechanisms can be found in other international conventions for example when we are talking about international convention against torture and there are some mechanisms for example state complaints uh, in, in this convention and international covenant on civil and political rights also uh, have some uh, some possibilities uh, to to use this convention so i think that states could use uh, these international mechanisms to start investigations and to start uh, legal procedures under these mechanisms and as uh, belarus uh, adopted Convention against tortures and uh, uh, Belarus is a member of UN and International Covenant on, and on civil and political rights are also the documents uh, that Belarus should apply. So uh, it's possible to start the procedures under this convention and conventions, and this uh, may be useful. Thank you very much. Uh, if anybody of speakers, you. Have, yeah. It, it, Sorry, point. I just wanted to, to clarify something because I'm not sure if the question called for an explanation of the jurisdiction of International Court of Justice or the International Criminal Court. And we must distinguish between the two because the International Criminal Court, of course, deals with individual criminal responsibility. And the International Court of Justice deals with the responsibility of states vis-a-vis -vis other states. So if we talk about the ICC, there's no chance, uh, at least now, to refer the situation to the ICT because Belarus is not a party to the International Criminal Court, as, as Sergei correctly uh, said, and the uh, Security Council referral is not on the table because of a potential of a Russia and Belarus veto. But I think that it's true that in the International Court of Justice, there is a there are some treaties that might give an opportunity to bring a case against Belarus, and I'm thinking primarily the civil aviation treaties because those have compromissory clauses that give access to the International Court of Justice. So I'd be curious to see, I think if we'll see a case against the Belarus regime, it will more likely be International Court of Justice, but dealing with some aviation questions. Uh, and I'm talking, of course, about the incident with the Ryanair flight that was hijacked uh, by the authorities. 
Yes, um, I agree. I agree with Ilya that uh, International Court of Justice could be used. And uh, I think two cases. First one uh, is this Ryanair case, which could be put to this to International Court of Justice by uh, any state uh, which uh, can be in, in can be engaged in in this procedure. And also, uh, Convention Against Tortures also can be used in order to uh, put those accountable in the International Court of Justice. Uh, thank you very much, Ilya and uh, Sergei. So I think I would like to go to the final remarks. Uh, maybe Ludmila and Victoria, could you make like our final remarks and we will finish the discussion, which was very fruitful. And thank you very much for all your insights. So Ludmila, maybe you would like to have final word. Я хотела бы сказать, только выразить свою надежду на то, чтобы процесс, негативный процесс в отношении адвокатов, который вот мы видим, все ускоряется, каким-то образом притормозился, и чтобы действительно адвокаты не покидали профессию так массово и могли оказывать профессиональную помощь людям. Вот, поэтому любые меры, которые могут быть приняты э, в помощь адвокатам э, к тем лицам, которые причастны к, к тому, чтобы адвокаты лишали своей, своей профессии, я э, считаю, должны быть приветствов приветствоваться. Thank you very much, Людмила and Victoria. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to say that uh, as far as we don't have any national means to uh, for accountability and for justice, it's very important for everyone, for every victim of human rights violation to document uh, uh, his or her situation and also to use uh, all available international means uh, for example, we, we are starting to help people with uh, universal jurisdiction cases in Lithuania. So now we have five cases in Lithuania and uh, we continue this work. Also, we can use uh, Human Rights Committee. Uh, also, we can use um, you know, UN Examination Mission, which is now working uh, in uh, uh, Lithuania, Poland and Ukraine to interview uh, victims of human rights, rights violations. It's very important for good reports uh, in the international level to keep uh, Belarus uh, at the top of the international agenda and uh, to keep all these human rights violations uh, at the, in the international level. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Victoria. Uh, we have again, Harry Hunt, could you be short? And... Yeah, one, one final idea, I forgot to mention it. Uh, it is not you know, specifically focused so much on the situation of lawyers. But uh, one idea that has been raised, uh, you know, by us uh, with the uh, Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs would be the submission of an uh, interstate complaint under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Belarus has, um, you know, agreed to, has, has accepted this procedure uh, when it acceded to the convention. Um, and we think that this possibility should be explored and used. Uh, this is something, this is a procedure that is not used a lot. Interstate complaints are not, uh, you know, common, not used a lot, but, you know, we are in a situation where all possibilities should be explored. So we also are, uh, you know, campaigning for this. Thank you very much, Harry. Thank you very much uh, to all the speakers and for all the noble work you do to defend uh, people who are unjustly uh, persecuted and sentenced in Belarus and uh, all their human rights violations that they face and everything. Thank you very much uh, for all your insights, for all your recommendation and uh, the background of the situation in Belarus. And uh, um, and we will prepare a summary with your recommendation and with actually your advice to both the international community and, uh, and democratic forces. And we'll try to keep the situation on the agenda. So thank you very much for all your words and uh, 
have a good day or evening, <laughs> depending on your time zone. Bye. Bye, all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.